Hello, and welcome once again to Antioch West Virtual. So glad that you're joining us again this month for our monthly broadcast that we do here at Antioch West. We're right in the middle of a tremendous series we've been doing. This will be uh, part four of the series, Questions That Deserve an Answer. And we've been looking at hard questions, questions that need to be examined, uh, and answering those questions not based off of opinion or based off what we think the answer should be, but we've been going to what the Word of God says. And all the way back in part one, we established uh, some very uh, precise criteria of how we would answer uh, questions in this series. And so we've been working our way, weaving our way through some very, uh, very, very important questions that need to be looked at. And there are questions that deserve an answer. These are not questions that should be answered um, simply by saying, well, you know, there's not really, you just got to believe it, or, well, it's, it's, it's really a mystery. You just kind of have to believe it. Doesn't really say that. You know, you may want to desire, you may desire to live that way. I don't desire to live that way. I believe that there are questions that when we ask them that there are answers that we can find in the Word of God. Now, you may not find them on your first pass. You may not find them just by being a casual reader, but I believe if you seek God and seek to know His Word, that He will show you the answers. One of the challenges that we found as we've explored this series and a challenge that we face in our life, uh, in all of our lives, especially as we continue to grow in God. And that is, it's very difficult to come to uh, the Word of God without any preconceived notions. Um, it's very hard to come to God with a, with, 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 a, with a completely neutral mindset. But that's very important that we do our best to do that, because anything that we've been taught, anything that's been shared to us, even if it was taught to us in sincerity, if it doesn't line up with the Word of God, then it's not, it's, it's, it, it's not something we can follow. My opinion, your opinion, that's our opinions. The only true truth, unchanging truth, is the truth of the Word of God. And so we, in this series, and if you have a chance to go back and you can watch some of the previous uh, lessons that we've done, and I encourage you to do so. You can find those others here uh, on this channel, or you can go back and you can search for them. Part one, part two, part three, and part four, uh, we have really looked at some questions that when you, when you ask these questions, you might already say, well, I already know the answer. And you may know the answer, but do you know the biblical answer? And I'm sure there have been some things that in this series that I have answered that maybe some would disagree with. And it's not about well, I'm right and they're wrong, or they're wrong and they're right and I'm wrong. It's about what does the Bible say, pure and simple. We cannot add to, we can't take away from. Um, it, you know, it doesn't matter if everybody says it's right. If it's the Bible says it's wrong, it's wrong. So in this um, series, we've really focused on just staying with in the text of Scripture. Not only that, but the other thing that we've done, and you can see this in part one, where we discuss this in length. But one of the things we've also done is we're not just answering questions with one scripture. We've been using the criteria out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. In many of these cases, we've had more than two or three witnesses. Uh, in fact, today, when we discuss some of these questions, we'll have 15 different examples. Uh, and so I say that because when something is that prevalent in scripture, where it's, it's mentioned throughout scripture, point after point after point, then we've got to stop for a moment and take notice and say, wait, you know, maybe there is some truth to this. So I challenge you, <clears throat> if this is your first time wa watching this series, thank you for joining into us, but I encourage you to go back and watch all of this for the last uh, couple of months here, and I challenge you to go beyond just what you think and get to really to find out what the Bible says uh, and, and uh, ask God to help you enter these with a, with a, with a, with a neutral, open mind. And uh, maybe you already know these answers, and I'm just refreshing you or just helping you understand them in a greater way. So again, thank you for joining us, and uh, I, I, I'm, I'm excited about what we're going to be covering today in part four of Questions That Deserve 
an answer. All right, part, the first question that we're going to tackle tonight is actually something we've discussed in the last part, but I want to go back over it again um, because I want, it's, it's important that we still understand this question as we go into what we're going to talk about uh, in this, uh, in this uh, lesson today. Um, that was the question we ask is, if salvation requires more than faith, then what is the full plan of salvation? We went into this at depth uh, in the previous um, parts, uh, so I'm not going to go into it quite, but I want to just read some scriptures to you again that give us the full breadth of it, that the Bible, uh, that, 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 that yes, we know faith is important, but is it just more, is it faith, or is there more to being saved than just faith? And I believe the Bible is very clear on that. Um, we talked about it last time, and I would encourage you again, go back and listen to it. The book of James very specifically gives us that um, faith without works is dead, that there needs to be faith, but there has to be actions to your faith. I say it this way, a little saying that I've, I've used before is that actions speak louder than words. Faith is great, but actions can trump faith. So to have faith with no action, do you really have faith? And so one of these important to answer in this question is, is it take more than faith to be saved? Absolutely, because faith is one part of it, but it also takes action. Well, the question is then, what is that action? Well, the Bible very gives us some very straight answers of what that action is. Acts 2, uh, verse 37 says, Now when they heard this, they were cut in their hearts, said to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? That was faith. What do we do? I've got it. We believe. Now what's next? And Peter said to them, repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins or the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children, to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. But that's just one part. Let's go back and look at it again. John chapter 3. This is a very important passage of Scripture. And if you're reading out of a red-letter edition of the Bible, you know a lot of these words that I'm about to read are in red letters. That doesn't make them any better than the rest of the words, but uh, the uh, translators or particular Bible uh the people that create certain Bibles like to put the words of Jesus in red letters. I think that's great for reference. The danger of that is, is that sometimes we elevate the red letters uh, more than the black letters. The entire Bible is God's word. Uh, but the red letters do let us know that Jesus is talking. Uh, but John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered to him and said, this is talking to Nicodemus, and not, I, 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 uh, not to get into the whole background of that, but this is a fascinating uh, story in the scripture. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot enter or see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time in some other woman to be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly I say to you, unless a man is born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So now we got two different witnesses, Acts and John, both recording that there are multiple steps in this process of what do we do when we have faith. The men said to Peter that day, we believe, what do we do? Uh, Nicodemus believed, he's asking Jesus what to do, and both of the answers given match up. Peter said, uh, be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that we are to be born of water, that's baptism, and to be born of spirit, that's receiving the Holy Spirit. Both of these line up, but let's go further. Titus chapter 3, verse 3, for we ourselves were once were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness of the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy has saved us, how did he save us? Well, he saved us through faith. That's not what the Bible says. We are saved through his mercy. He saved us through the washing of regeneration. And the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So again, we have that, 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 that dual act, water, spirit, water and spirit, washing. And we went into this last lesson, this whole entire thing of why uh, baptism is an act of washing. So we got that same typology again, 
Remember, the action, faith, got it. But faith then, per- then takes us, faith precedes these actions. I've got to believe, but then after I believe, here are some actions I take. Baptism, water, baptism of spirit. And finally, uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 1, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation. What's the foundation? What's the starting point? What's that foundation? Here's the foundation. Repentance from dead works and a faith towards God and the doctrines of baptisms. Again, we went into this last time, but that's not a singular baptism. It's baptisms. Well, what's the baptisms? Well, we went over it again. Baptism of water, baptism of spirit. So again, we're answering this question not through opinion. A lot of people say you got to believe. Absolutely, you need to believe. A lot of people say if you know you have uh, faith saves you, one thousand percent saves you. But faith is the first step. What do you do after faith? There's got to be a step beyond faith. Faith alone does not save you. Faith is the predecessor to those things that we must do to step into a covenant relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that is a part of our salvation journey. So again, does it require more than faith to be saved? Absolutely. What are those steps? Well, we just read it. There's more in there, but these are the steps necessary that take us beyond faith. If you believe, that's great, but what are you doing after you believe? We got to see what the scripture says. Not what a church says, a doctrine or a particular religion. It's simply what does the Bible say? I don't care who's right, who's wrong. Oh, this group's wrong and this group's right. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters to me is what does the Bible say? And that's the most important thing that we've got to look at. Let's, let's take a step back here in uh, this next question. We talked about in the first question uh, what requires more than faith. This question, I want to take a bigger approach. Let's, let's zoom way out for a second if we can, and let's look at this. Is the Holy Ghost, we keep hearing this Holy Ghost thing, is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the primary focus of the New Testament, the New Covenant? Um, is that the primary focus of the what's going on? Because we don't really hear much about the Holy Spirit until we get into the New Testament. Is that really by accident or is that on purpose? Well, let's get into some scripture and find out what the Bible says. Let's go all the way back to the Old Testament first, and let's read two scriptures out of the Old Testament. First is Joel chapter 2, verse 28 says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Let's go to the other verse here in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 28, verse 11. For with stammering lips and an unknown another tongue, he will speak to his people, to whom he said, this is the rest which you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Now, these are two verses that were established in the prophetic in the Old Testament. But let's look at the fulfillment in the New Testament and how it's brought out. Acts chapter 2, verse 16. This is Peter speaking on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, he says this, verse 16. But this is that which is spoken of by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, said God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Now, he wasn't just simply quoting Joel. He starts off in verse 16 saying, this is the thing that was spoken of the prophet Joel. What thing? What is he talking about? What is the this of verse 16? The this of verse 16, what is hap- what happened in the first 12 verses of chapter 2? They were in the upper room praying, seeking God. There came a, a mighty rushing wind. It filled the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them clothing tongues like of the fire set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. That's what Peter is referring to, but Peter's not referring to it simply as an act, a single act. Peter is going all the way back into the Old Testament promises and said this was already prophesied it was going to happen, that God was going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. This is the beginning of that right here. This is the start of that, this event, this deal. And that that single event, that that that. Uh, that took place in the book of Acts is the beginning of that New Testament church 
uh, we, that it was the beginning of the of of the of the start of the New Testament church as we know it, and how it spread through Jerusalem, eventually the world. It was founded on the foundation of the prophecy given in Joel chapter two, but it was the fulfillment came because the Holy Spirit had manifested itself in the upper room. But let's not stop there. So we read it in Isaiah twenty eight. Um, where it says stammering lips and another tongue. Well, let's go to Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 21 says, in the law it is written with men of other tongues and other lips I will speak to his people. And yet for all that, they will not hear me. So he's quoting and paraphrasing to a degree what Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 28. But he says, verse 22 of 1 Corinthians 14, therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to the unbelievers. So this whole thing, this spirit, we go back to this thing that it's a sign to us that this whole thing, and Paul is very strategic in bringing out the promises or the applic the, 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 the foreshadowing of the old, bring it into the new, say, okay, that happened then. That was spoken then, but it didn't happen for them. But it's happening now to us. And finally, we just read it in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter said, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But that's not the, the, the verse. The verse is 39 says, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Now, this is a very controversial Verse because a lot of people say, well, the Holy Ghost was for them at that time, but it's not for us today. Well, then who's the far off and who is the as many as our Lord God shall call? That's an infinite number. That number does not have a limit to it. That's not for the first thousand, the first 10,000, the first 20,000. You go up to a, a baseball game or a sporting event and they'll say for the first 10,000 people that entered the stadium today, you're going to get a free hat. So if you're number 10,322, guess what? You're not getting a hat because you were too late. There's no limit on this. Peter didn't say, for the promises to you and to your children, meaning those who were there that day, and for the first 30,000 to enter in the church. Outside of that, no one else needs it. It says as many, those who are far off, as meaning there's no geographical limitations, so number one, he wasn't just saying it's just for Jerusalem. There was no geographical limitations, as many as afar off, meaning all over the world, as many as the Lord God shall call. So with no geographical limitations, and there were no numerical uh, uh, limitations. Peter just completely dismissed the idea that this is just for this moment. He took the geographical limitations off of it, and he took the numerical uh, uh, the, um, um limitations off of is it. Why? Because it's for everybody. It's for you. It's for me. It's for all of us. This is the primary focus of why the New Testament church changed the world was because the power of the Holy Ghost. Now we're getting a little farther into this. We're taking it step by step. We talked about the fact that it's beyond faith. We need more than faith. Now we're talking more into the idea that um, we're talking about the old and new and how the old is brought to life in the New Testament. But let's go a step further because uh, we there's a very clear description given to us by John the Baptist uh, that one of the purposes of Jesus coming, the Messiah come. In fact, the question is what did John the Baptist declare that the Messiah was coming to do? What, 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 what was Jesus, what was the Messiah truly coming to do? Well, we know a lot of people say he was coming to seek and save that which was lost. Got it. He was coming to die on the cross for our sins. Yes, 100% got it. But there was, it was more than that because John tells us, uh, John the Baptist tells us um, what he was coming to do. John, uh, Matthew chapter 11 Matthew chapter 3, verse number 11, I apologize. It says this, I indeed, now this is John the Baptist talking, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Notice, there's that word baptize. We understand, everybody understands that baptism requires water. 
We got baptism of water, but there's also a second baptism. That's baptism of the Spirit. And John said that the Messiah was coming, and he was going to be the baptizer of the Holy Spirit in fire. And finally, we find in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, it says this, And being assembled together with them, he commanded, this is Jesus talking, He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly, now he's quoting. Now Jesus is quoting John. So don't say, well, that was just John the Baptist's opinion. Well, it must have been important enough to Jesus that he took time to go back and quote John the Baptist because he said, John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So don't say, well, you know, that was John the Baptist's opinion. Apparently it wasn't just John the Baptist's opinion. Jesus had the same opinion because Jesus quoted John. So again, we see this great importance put on by John the Baptist and on Jesus. And we'll get into this further in just a few minutes, that Jesus put great emphasis on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that he came to be the baptizer of the Holy Spirit. He came to usher in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, let's get into something here that's a, 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 of, of great debate um, in the Christian community and something that I want to really look at for a few moments here that's of great importance. Uh, we talked about the fact, you know, faith, we need more than faith, okay. Uh, we talked about there's a, there's a focus of the New Testament that really revolves around a lot to do with the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, we talked about that Jesus came to be the baptized of the Holy Ghost in fire. But the question is, is the baptism of the Holy Spirit necessary for salvation? This is a huge question that have a, a lot of opinion on. People argue this question at great length. Is it, okay, look, I, we got to have faith. We know that. But is it really necessary to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Or is it optional? Or is it only for a select few? Or maybe it's not for any of us at all today. Um, so... Let's look at this here. Again, let's not look at it from what your opinion is, what my opinion is. Let's look at it. What does the Word of God say is the answer? So we're going to read a couple verses we've already read, but we're going to read them again in the context of the question, is the baptism of the Holy, Holy, Holy Spirit necessary for salvation? The first one I'd like to point you to is, again, Acts chapter 2, verse 37, 38, and 39. We've already read them at length, but specifically verse 39 that says, For the promise is unto you and your children and to all afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now, in the last question, I explained to you that that last part of the verse gives an infinite geographical and infinite numerical uh, number that the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the promise is not bound by geography. It's not bound by number. And I would say if it's not bound by geography and not bound by number, therefore it's not bound by time as well. So the first thing we have to look at is this promise that Peter was talking about of forgiveness of sins and baptism and infilling of the Holy Ghost is a promise that is for everyone. You and me sitting here uh, 2,000 years later, that promise is still in play. God has not changed his mind. He did not say it was for a select few. So first and foremost, we've got to understand that the promise of the Holy Ghost is for us living here today. But let's look at it here a little further. Let's look at some things that Jesus actually said. Jesus said in Luke chapter 24, uh, verse 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Then we've got this whole thing that's echoed again in Acts chapter 1. We just read it, but we'll read it again. And being assembled together from with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You've heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with Holy Spirit, not many dig. So this is something that Jesus is bringing and ushering it in. That Jesus saying, I want to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, I got to be honest with you. The debate is, well, that was just for that group. But Peter comes back and says, it's not just for that group. That's for everybody. So my question is, can you reject what Jesus is trying to give without rejecting Jesus? You say, well, the Holy Ghost is a gift. Okay, it's a gift. 
But if you, can you reject a gift without rejecting the gift giver? You say, well, it's a gift. And if you want to receive it, you can receive it because it's a gift. That's great. But the problem with that is, can you reject the gift and not reject the gift giver? So you say to me, well, it's only a gift. You know, it's only, it's a gift. Okay, great. So you can choose if you want to receive the gift or not. But if you choose not to receive the gift, are you rejecting the gift? Or are you rejecting the giver of the gift also? If I had something here, if I said to you, hey, here, I'd like to give you this iPad as a gift. You say, you know, I'm, I'm okay. I don't really want it. Thank you. I appreciate that. But I don't really want it. You know, I, how am I supposed to respond to that? Are you rejecting the iPad? Or are you kind of rejecting me? Now, I know we can justify it. No, I wouldn't. No, you know, maybe you don't want an iPad. I understand you say that, but let's be honest. If this is my iPad and this is my prized possession and I want to give it to you, it's, it's, I want you to have this, but you say, no, no, it's okay. I, I, don't, I don't really want it. If this is something I'm giving you, is this a, is this, if this is a part of me I'm giving, then how can, I, how can you reject that without me being rejected? Think about that for a second. Well, let's go further. Romans chapter 8. Verse number nine says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. What's the spirit of Christ? The spirit of Christ is the Holy Spirit. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, who he who has raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. Is there a multiple spirits? Is there a spirit of Christ, spirit of the Father, and spirit of the Holy Ghost? No, it's one spirit. So right here, Romans, Paul saying, if you don't have the spirit of Christ in you, you're dead. You're dead. Well, if is the Holy Ghost necessary? Is the baptism of the Holy Ghost necessary for salvation? Well, let me ask you this. Can you be saved dead? Spiritually dead? Can you be saved spiritually dead? No. Spiritual salvation requires life. Well, how do I come to life? I've got to have the Spirit of Christ dwelling in me. Well, let's go further. We already read the scripture again, but Titus chapter 3, verse number 5. Not by works of righteousness, how are we saved? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. How? Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So again, how has he saved us? He saved us by mercy, yes, but his mercy did these things washed us, and renewed us in the Holy Spirit. John chapter 3, we just read it, but read it again. Verse 5, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and of spirit, he cannot, 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 no back doors, no side doors, no, no windows left unlocked. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. There's no way around that. We're going to get into that verse in just a moment a little deeper. How about this one? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. By, for by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. How many spirits? One spirit. What spirit? The Holy Spirit. Whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves are free, we have all been made to drink into one spirit. Again, how do we get into one body? How do we get into this body? The body of the church, the body of Christ. It's by one spirit. There's not an option. And finally, John chapter 7, verse 37, it says, On the last day, that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. He who believes in me. Now, if you believe in Christ, there's that faith thing again. As the scripture has said, again, now there's two major points here. Do you believe? Check. How do I believe? I have to believe as the scripture says. So I can't believe how I think or how a church thinks or how my pastor thinks or how this person thinks or this guy on TV says this or this person. I have to think like the Bible says. So he says, do you believe in me and do you think like the scripture thinks? Out of, if you have these two criteria straight, out of your heart will flow rivers of living water. But this, now what are you talking about? This cryptic thing about water. Well, he gives us explanation. Verse 39, but this he spoke concerning what? The Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Spirit was not given yet because Jesus was yet not yet glorified. So we've got a massive amount of stuff in that verse. Number one, we've got the check mark of we need faith. Got it. 
the check mark of we got to have the scripture. The check mark is when we have these two things, something's going to flow out of us. What's going to flow out of us? The Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit wasn't given yet. Why? Because Jesus wasn't yet glorified. Now, let me ask you this. If the Holy Spirit's some separate deal, why couldn't the Holy Spirit come if Jesus hadn't been glorified? Well, because Jesus and the Holy Spirit, it's the same thing. Jesus had to be glorified so that instead of being in a mortal body, he had to take on immortality so that he could say, no longer am I Christ with you, but I can be Christ in you. The cross, see, that's what the cross did. The cross made the difference, not just in salvation, not just in forgiveness of sins, but the cross became the place where, where Christ was no longer with us, but Christ could be in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. There's other verses here that I don't have time to go into. You can look up front for your own uh, for your own study later. I would encourage you to look up 1 John chapter 3, verse 24, Romans 5, verses 1 through 5, Galatians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 through 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, John chapter 14, verses 6 through 20, and then verse 26. John chapter 15, verse 26, John six, chapter 16, verse 7, and finally 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. This is, just off the top of my head, let's count it up real quick. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. There's 17 references, and that's just, that's not even a full list. That's just 17 I have here in my notes. That's 17 references. 17 References. There's more in there, specifically tying the desire for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit and the need for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I got to be honest with you, 17 times? I don't think that's by accident. Now, you can maybe justify one, justify two, but 17, I think it's really important. We take a look. We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit in our life. All right, now we're talking about uh, salvation. We talked about sort of the big picture stuff here. Uh, we talked about the um, uh, baptism of the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit involved in the salvation process. Let's take just a moment here if we can. Let's look at something here, and that is, is the infilling of the Holy Ghost and the baptism of the Holy Ghost the same thing, or is it different? Is there different? And really, they're the same thing, and to answer this question, let's just go through some scripture and look at phrasing. It's the same deal, different phrasing, but it's the same deal. We're going to run through some of this stuff here quickly. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this question, but I wanted just to bring this up because sometimes people like to try to, um, uh, you know, um, make a big deal out of things, trying to find a loophole when they're really, when, when, when really that's not the case at all. And this is being one. Some people try to make the argument that the infilling of the Holy Ghost and the baptism of the Holy Ghost are the two different things, and therefore, you know, they're separate deals. But really, it comes down to language and phrasing more than it actually has to do with describing two separate acts. So let's go through a couple of these again. Just look at the different phrasing, understanding it's speaking of the same event, but just phrased differently. Matthew chapter 3, some of these we've already read, but again, we're going to read them again within the context of this question. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Mark chapter 1, verse 8, I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John, uh, Luke 3, verse 16, John answered, said to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but the one is mightier than I is coming. Uh, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Luke 24, verse 36. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and is thus is necessary that Christ to suffer and be raised from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are to be witness of things. Behold, I send the promise unto you, but you will tarry in Jerusalem to your due with power. Now, what was that in doing of power? It was the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It was the infilling of the Holy Ghost. So again, there's another different phrasing of the same exact act. 
Uh, John chapter 1, verse 32 says, And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it rem remained upon him. I do not know him, but he who set, who sent me to baptize with water said, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and re remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and finally, John chapter 7, verse 39, But he spoke this concerning the Holy Spirit, for these who believing in him would receive for the Holy Spirit was not giving because John Jesus was not yet glorified. Again, there's this receiving and doing and filling, baptizing. It's the same act. It's all speaking of the same act. It all is speaking of this culmination that really took place in Acts chapter 2. There's more here. Uh, John chapter 20, verse 22. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, verses 8. Uh, Acts chapter 2, uh, the entire chapter really, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 46. Acts chapter 11, verses 15 through 18. Acts chapter 15, verses 7 through 9. Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and Titus 3, 5, and 7. Again, different phrasing, speaking of the same thing. Now, if you want to try to categorize these things, you have difficulties because you have to show where each one of these events uh, was fulfilled. But if you realize that all of this was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, as described in Acts chapter 2, that the phrasing of these is, is really just pointing to the same event, the same deal. Uh, Jesus said, John chapter 3, baptize the water and the Spirit. John said he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Um, and Jesus, in John chapter 7, verse 39, says the Holy Ghost was a kid to be given because Jesus wasn't glorified yet. When was the Holy Ghost given? It was given on the day of Pentecost. Who gave it? Jesus. John said he was the one that was going to baptize the Holy Ghost in fire. We've got all these different descriptions, all these different accounts pointing to the same event. So let's not separate these events and try to categorize them as, well, this is that and this is that. It's really all pointing to the same exact thing. So that's something we really need to look at because a lot of times uh, people want to try to find loopholes. I'll give you a good example. We've read this verse many, many times, um, but uh, the King James Bible, if you're using a King James Bible, that's a version of the Bible that we're reading from today. We're actually reading from the New King James Bible. But the word used in the New King James Bible a lot is the word remission of sins. Well, remission is the Greek word translated forgiveness. So there's not a remission of sins and a forgiveness of sins. It's the same thing. Just two words used to describe the same act. All right, final question here in part four. And uh, this is a very, very controversial question because it, it's really going to hit at a at, at, at a very large debate within the Christian community, uh, and that is this question, is speaking in tongues the necessary initial sign of the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Okay, so we understand we need to receive the Holy Spirit. We need to be baptized by the Holy Spirit, but what is this speaking in tongues stuff? Do I need to speak in tongues to have the Holy Spirit? Can I have the Holy Spirit without speaking in tongues? A lot of people say, well, I have Christ dwelling in me. I have his Spirit dwelling in me but I don't speak in tongues. Can you separate the two? Are there two separate things here, or are they really the same thing? Well, let's look again what the Scripture says is a part of this. And I want to read to you a Scripture that we've read several times before, but I want to really look at the depth of it here because there's something of great importance I want to point out to you in this. John chapter 3, verse number 5 says, Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say unto you, unless one is born of the water and of spirit, he cannot enter in the kingdom of heaven. So again, we've kingdom of God. We've seen this duality of baptisms, water and spirit. And he goes on to say, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. But do not marvel that I say unto you, you must be born again. Now here's the verse, verse 8. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, cannot tell where it comes or where it goes, where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, this verse is of great importance to us today. This verse right here is major. Number one, it's Jesus talking. Number two, this verse is unlocking or expanding upon what Jesus had said to Nicodemus in verse number five, because you have to understand the context again. 
Jesus said to Nicodemus, you got to be born of water and a spirit. Being, being baptized of water was not a new thing for Nicodemus. In fact, the Jews had been practicing, and there was a, an, a, a, a something that was already in common practice, and that was back, baptism in, the, uh, in a mikvah. I don't have time to go through all that, but look it up. There's this, there's a whole ritual of cleansing that would happen when someone would walk into a mikvah. This was a bap, uh, a, a, a tank of water, a, a place of water, and they would walk in and they would fully submerge themselves into uh, this, this pool of water, and it was a ritualistic cleansing that they would go through. They'd already understood that water can wash away stains of sin. They got that. That wasn't a foreign concept, but he said, you got to be born of the spirit. This was a new concept. So Jesus didn't leave him hanging. Jesus gave him the description of what it meant to be born of the spirit. And he gave it to him and the wind blows where it listed. Now here's the sound thereof. You can't tell where it's coming from, where it's going, but you hear the sound of it. So is everyone that's born of the spirit. What does all that mean? Because we've got this wind, we got a sound. What does all that mean? Well, here's that one of those things, I've talked about it several times in this series, but this is one of those times where translators, again, the Bible was written in Greek and Hebrew mostly, a little bit of Aramaic sprinkled in, especially in the Gospels, but mostly Greek and Hebrew. New Testament is both, is, is predominantly Greek. The Old Testament is, is, is all in Hebrew. Again, I'm not a Greek scholar. I don't speak Greek. I don't speak Hebrew. I'm not a Hebraic scholar. So the problem with it is because I can't read those languages in their original uh, in, in the original, I have to rely on what we call biblical translations. There are many different biblical translations we find. I'm particularly reading out of one right now called the New King James Version of the Bible. Again, is it the Word of God? Yes, it's the Word of God. But again, you got to be careful because it's a translation of the Word of God. Why is this important? Because when men translated words out of the out of the original language into English language, some things got lost in translation. I had the privilege of traveling all over the world and very blessed by God to be able to minister in many different countries, and I've used a translator. And I have to be careful when using a translator because there are some things I can say in English, and there's some things I can even say in English to an American audience that cannot be translated into whatever language I'm in. I've preached, uh, I've been translated into uh, African dialects, into Russian, into Spanish, into French, uh, into German. Um, I've had uh, translations in the Philippines, uh, many different translations. I've been translated into Chinese. Uh, there have been different, many different ways that as I've spoken, my words have been translated as I have spoken in a sermon. The question, the, the problem with that is you will find that sometimes it takes the, the, the interpreter a little longer. So if you say a phrase like, uh, you know, God loves you just like you are. You don't have to change, but he loves you just like you are. That translation of that in certain languages may be a very long description because to connotate the, 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 the translator who speaks English understands what I'm trying to say, but he's also trying to get his audience to hear what I'm trying to say, but he has to use different words. I said all that to say this is a prime example in this verse of Scripture of what happens when this takes place in the error. Now, I want to look at two particular words in the scripture, very important. Number one is the word wind. The second is the word sound. The word wind here is translated almost every other place in scripture as spirit. Spirit. For some reason, the translators decided to translate it here, wind. I don't know what was in their head at the time when they did it, but it's translated, look it up. It's translated every other place almost as spirit. And the word sound is the Greek word phoneo, or where we get the root word for phonics. So it's more than just a sound, but it's actually audible syllables that form the building blocks of languages or words. So let's look at this here, and let's look at the description because this is of great importance. Jesus said you got to be born of water and of spirit. We got that established. But what does it mean to be born of spirit? Jesus says to Nicodemus, don't marvel that I said you got to be born again. Here's, a, here's something of great importance. The spirit, whose spirit? God's spirit. The spirit of God will blow. 
where it desires. The Spirit of God will blow where it wants to go, where it wishes. The Spirit of God, you can't control it. It goes where it wishes, but you'll hear the sound thereof. What were? You'll hear the phonics, the languages, the audible syllables. You won't know where it's coming from or where it's going. And then he stops and he gives us the key. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So if you say today, I'm born of the Spirit, the question is, have you experienced what Jesus described here? Have you had the experience where the Spirit of God blew over you? And when you blew over you, you, had, you heard the sounds, the phonics, that you didn't understand where it was coming from or where it was going, but it was a sign of everyone that is born of the Spirit. Again, he did not leave out a select group. He did not say this was only for those. He said everyone, 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 every single one that is born of the Spirit will have this happen. So let's look if he was, was he right? Well, Acts chapter 2 verse 4 says, and when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So Jesus prophesied to Nicodemus this was going to happen, and then all of a sudden it took place. Don't forget, Jesus backed this up. We already read it, but I want to read it again. Jesus backed up this whole thing. John chapter 7, verse 38, he said, He that believes on me, as the scripture says, out of his heart shall flow river of living water. And he said, this he spoke of the Holy Spirit. Now notice, there's a this is not semantics. Remember what it's saying. But not into the heart, out of the heart. Out of, meaning there's something that's going to come out of you, like a river. What is that river going to come out of you? It's going to be the Spirit. When you believe and you do what the Scripture says, there's going to be an out of experience. Not just simply an into, but there's an out of. A lot of people talk about the fact they've got the into, but Jesus said you don't just need the into, but you need the out of. And the out of, he wasn't just speaking of some crazy experience. The out of he was speaking of was in John chapter 7, verse 39, when he said, These he spoke of the Holy Ghost, which had not been given because Jesus had not been glorified. How about Mark chapter 16, verse 17? And these signs shall follow them who believe in my name, in Jesus, in the name of Jesus. They will cast out devils. They will speak with new tongues. In whose name are they going to speak with new tongues? Jesus. Who's the baptizer of the Holy Ghost? Jesus. Who's the giver of the Holy Spirit? Jesus. Who promised the Holy Spirit? Jesus. Who said you will speak with new tongues? Jesus. Acts chapter 10, verse 44 this is the first time a Gentile had experienced the Spirit of God. Up until this point, they thought it was just for Jews. But this is the first time a Gentile does it. Watch what happens. While Peter was well speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard the word. And those who of circumcision believed were astonished, meaning the Jews were astonished as many came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Ghost was being poured out on the Gentiles. How did they know they had the Holy Ghost? How did they know that the Holy Spirit was being poured out upon them? Because verse 46, because they heard them speak. They heard, heard them speak with other tongues. Heard them. How did they know that those who had who were sitting there that day received the Holy Spirit? Did they pray a simple prayer? Lord, I receive your spirit today. Didn't say that. How did they know the moment they received the Holy Spirit? Because they heard them speak in other tongues. So remember what we said Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians? He said that tongues is a sign for the unbeliever. They didn't believe. Those Jews did not believe. They were unbelievers. They didn't believe that Gentiles could receive it. How did they go from unbeliever to believer? They went from unbeliever to believer because they heard them speak in other tongues. How do I believe I have the Holy Ghost? Well, it's just by faith. Faith is great, but what do you latch your faith onto? How do you go from unbeliever to believer? Tongues, speaking in tongues is a sign that takes me from being an unbeliever to believer. That way I'm sure, I know. But let's not stop there. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, finding some disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit since you believed? Now we got faith, but Paul saying faith is great. But what happened after this? So they said to him, we have not so much heard that there be Holy Spirit. And we don't have no idea what you're talking about, Paul. Then he said to them, and when, in what then were you baptized? And they said, in John's baptism. Then Paul said to them, 
They should believe on him who came after him. That is on Jesus Christ. He said, that was great you believed in John, but you got to believe in the guy that John said was the guy. John was awesome, but what about the guy beyond John? Jesus Christ. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. Now, so they were baptized once in John's baptism, but when they heard about the fact that Jesus was the one that came, they got baptized again in Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus. And when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came to them. How did they, how'd the Holy Spirit come to them? How did Paul know they'd received the Holy Spirit? Because they spoke with tongues and prophesied. There's more verses here. We can get into Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17, 1 Corinthians 12, 7, James 1, 26, James 3, 2 through 8, 1 Corinthians 14, 2 and 4, 1 Corinthians 14, 14 and 18. Again, all of these are pointing to the same fact as that is this, that tongues and speaking of tongues is not some kind of semantic. It's not some kind of parlor trick. It's not a magic trick. It's not some kind of uh, ruse or scam, but that is a, it is the, initial sign to help you believe and know that you've received the Holy Spirit. What happened? Jesus said, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit, baptized of water, baptized of the Spirit. How do I know I've been baptized of the Spirit? He said to uh, Nicodemus, you're going to hear this wind. It's going to blow. The sound, the Spirit's going to blow. You're going to hear phonics, the languages. You're not going to want to tell what it's coming from, where it's going. So is everyone in the born of the Spirit. Acts chapter 2, it happened just like Jesus said. There was a sound from heaven like a wind. They described the Spirit of God moving like a wind. It set upon each of them. They began to speak in other tongues. They didn't know where it was coming. God was given the utterance. Remember the Bible says in verse 4, it gave, that Spirit gave utterance. That means it didn't come from them. It came from a place beyond their mind. And then everybody around was confused. How are these people doing all this? Go read it. I don't understand. They're speaking this language, that language. And Peter said, this is a sign that was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And everyone can receive this. Repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and filling of the Holy Ghost. It's for everybody. No geographical restrictions, no numerical restrictions. And then we find again, time and time again, Acts chapter 10, Cornelius, the first Gentile, Devout man, pray. go read the story of Cornelius. Devout man prayed to God always, believed in God, did his best to live a godly life, but yet he needed to be baptized and he needed to receive the Holy Spirit. And how did the Jews know that, he, they had, that those there had received the Holy Spirit? Because they began to speak in other tongues. And again, 19, Acts 19, Paul was speaking to the apostles, the disciples of John the Baptist, and when he spoke to them, they were baptized in the name of Jesus, and they also received the Holy Spirit. How did they know that? Because they began to speak in tongues and prophesy. Jesus said the signs that should follow them that believe. They'll cast out devils, and they will speak in new tongues. So the question is, do you have the Holy Spirit? And if the question is, how do you know you have the Holy Spirit? Well, you say, I've asked. I'm a, that's awesome. I mean that sincerely. That's not a negative. So thankful you've asked. But how do you know? When is the moment you know? When can you tell me for sure this is the moment I received it because I can? How do you know? Well, there should be a time where you know. It's not a guess. It's not faith. There should be evidence. There's evidence. This is the evidence of what has happened to take you from unbeliever to believer. I know some of these questions have been a little more difficult this time. I know there's very controversial. There's a lot of opinion out there. I know maybe if you're new and you're watching these, you have been arguing with me as I have presented to you some of these scriptural answers. But I challenge you this. Don't just this dismiss it because you disagree. I want you to sincerely ask Jesus to show you what his word says. Be honest with God. Say, God, you know, that guy on that... Uh, that guy on that on that uh, on that uh, video, on this, uh, he he said some things I don't agree with. But God, I don't want to miss out on anything you have for me. God, I don't want to miss out. I don't care what I was told. I don't care what I've been said, told was right, what was wrong. I want to know what you ask Jesus to show you. And you know what? If Jesus shows you something different, then I would challenge you to follow your journey as God shows you. But I challenge you, don't dismiss it because you don't agree with it right away. 
why don't you ask God to show you and go to the scripture with an open mind, not with just these questions, but all four parts of this series, questions that deserve an answer, and ask Jesus Christ to show you truth. Say, God, I don't want to be tainted by what I was told. I don't want to be tainted by this person, this church, this religion, this belief, this doctrine, this group, this denomination. God, I don't care what anyone says. I want to know what you said and what your word says. And I challenge you to go to the Bible with an open mind and say, okay, God, show me. Don't take my word for it. Please, I'm begging you, don't just take my word for it and say, well, that guy on, that guy on, the, on the computer, that guy on the phone, he said this. No, don't say that. You go find it yourself. Maybe you can use what I've said today as maybe a roadmap, but don't just take my word for it. Go read it for yourself. Study it for yourself. Ask God to show it to you for yourself. And when he does, then you'll know. It wasn't because I said it. It wasn't because that person said it. You'll know because Jesus showed you. That's the greatest thing about the Bible. The greatest thing about the Bible is you can sit down and read it with the author of the word sitting right next to you. Instead of having to call the author or send an email or a online social media message, you can ask the author, what were you trying to say here? What are you trying to say? And if you listen carefully, the author and the finisher of your faith will show you what to believe. I challenge you in Jesus' name. Don't be blinded by what you were told. Don't be blinded by what man says, but open your eyes that you can see the word of God just like God wants to show you. And you know what? When you do that, it will set you free. I challenge you to do that in love. I challenge you to do that in Jesus' name. It will change your life, and God will show you. He said, try me and put me to the test. If you do that, God's going to show you things you never believe were possible in Jesus' name. Thank you again for watching, as always, Antioch West Virtual for this month. We're so thankful that you take time out to watch these. Again, this is part four of this series. You can go back and watch the rest at your convenience. I encourage you to do so. And not only that, but share this with somebody. Sit down and watch it with them. Let's inspire one another to go further in our journey on this discipleship with Jesus Christ as we grow in our knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God bless you.